Welcome back to our lecture series. I am your professor, Professor Palin. We're going to be talking about social stratification today. Um, in anthropology, anthropologists only use three variables to study so social stratification, and that is wealth, power, and prestige. I'm going to give you the definitions of wealth, power, and prestige here in a second. Then we'll go over and give you an example of how uh, anthropologists measure social stratification. Wealth <clears throat> is the ownership or access to valued material goods. That's our definition of wealth. Power, power is the ability to make others do what you want based on coercion or legitimate authority. And prestige is respect, the esteem, and the overt approval granted by others to individuals they consider meritus. So how does one achieve wealth, power, and prestige. Well, let me tell you first, no culture has ever devised a successful means of organizing a large population without social stratification and inequality. We'll talk about inequality here in a second, but let's give an example in our own society of the variation in our own culture between wealth, power, and prestige. If we were to look at wealth, power, and prestige, and we gave some examples, the United States president as one, We'll throw in a celebrity, Kim Kardashian, as another, and we'll use myself as the example. Uh, let's do a comparison. In our society, the United States president, in comparison to Kim Kardashian and myself, who has the most wealth? Well, I can tell you that I don't make a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, we know that the United States president makes about $200,000 a year. Kim Kardashian, on the other hand, I don't know what her... Uh, what her financials are, you know, what the exact number is, but I guarantee you that she makes probably more money than the United States president and myself combined in a month. So if we were looking at the variation of wealth in our society, we looked at three individuals, the U.S. president, Kim Kardashian, and myself. And the only reason I choose Kim Kardashian is because we just need a celebrity, and she seems to be in the news quite recently. Um, we would say that she probably has more wealth than the other two examples. Now, when we think about power, the ability to coerce through force or legitimate authority, if we look at myself, I cannot force you through the Internet to read your assignments. So I really have no power to force you to do something. All right? Kim Kardashian cannot force you to buy her products that she uh, endorses. So she really doesn't have a lot of power. But the United States president, who's the commander-in-chief, has legitimate authority and can use military force if necessary um, when a problem arises. So again, I would say in this example, the United States president probably has more power than in your other two examples. Finally, there is prestige, the overt respect and esteem that ha one has on individuals in our society. And when we compare and look at other societies, the United States president is a very prestigious um, position. So I'd say he'd have a little bit of prestige. Now, Kim Kardashian is an unusual example because some people respect her, other people don't. So I would say she probably is an intermediate amount of prestige. And then when you look at myself, um, I've received a number of grants, uh, I've gotten some scholarship, scholar, scholarly works published. Uh, whether I have prestige or not is really on uh, those who are my colleagues and my peers, and those who are part of the archaeology and anthropology community. So I would say I probably have a little bit of prestige, not a lot. So again, when we look at the variation between wealth, power, and prestige in our society, we look three, at three members of our society, you would see that there's a variety, a variation between wealth, power, and prestige, and thus we could say that there's some social stratification that may be occurring in our own society. So let's take that as an example of social stratification and the variation between three important variables, which are wealth, power, and prestige. Let me first define inequality. Inequality refers to the extent to which culturally valued material and social rewards are given disproportionately to individuals, families, and other groups. When we look at the distribution of wealth, power, and prestige, it can vary as well, and this is what we call inequality. In 1967, Morton Freed identified the three basic types of inequality, and that's egalitarian, 
ranked, and stratified. In this lecture, we will talk in more detail about egalitarian societies, ranked societies, and stratified societies. But first, we're going to look at one example um, to understand social stratification and inequality between wealth, power, and prestige in another case example, and that's the Five Nation League of the Iroquois. Let's talk about them here now. I'll cut that out. <laughs> Put it in the bloopers. All right. Damn. <laughs> All, All right. right. Hold on. Good. All right. The Five Nations, or the League, the Iroquois League, in 1650 was composed of the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, the Seneca Indians. In 1720, though, the Tuscarora Indians joined the league. The Iroquois didn't refer to themselves as the Iroquois. They actually referred to themselves as the Houghtons of Sauny, which are the people of the Longhouse. In this society, women were sedentary and men were more nomadic. Women lived in the village. Uh, they lived in houses um, that were composed of blood relatives. Their job was to grow corn, beans, and squash. Um, the men were in charge of protection, building the houses, building the palisades. Um, they also helped the women clear the fields. And most time, the men were off hunting, fishing, engaged in warfare, trading, and diplomacy. So they were transients in uh, an Iroquois village. Women lived in the longhouses, in the dwellings, and they were composed by natural local residents Men uh, would leave their family and grow up and live with his wife and her parents. So we know that they were natural local and practiced matrilineal um, and, and were matrilineal. Um, in the Iroquois society, women and descent and inheritance was passed through female lines. And ceremonial life revolved around women's actions and activities. Certainly men held leadership positions outside of the household, but women nominated and occasionally held positions of power. So in our society, which is different from the Iroquois society, women had more power and more prestige. In our society, we can look and reflect on the variation in gender within our society and who has more wealth, power, and prestige. We're not going to go into too much detail and self-reflect on the variation between wealth, power, and prestige in our society, but we can think about it and then make the comparison to the Iroquois League of Nations. Um, if we were to say that all men were created equal, uh, equal, how do we account for these inequalities within our own societies, right? Um, There are social groups, such as families, classes, and ethnic groups that have unequal access to important advantages, such as economic resources, power, and prestige. Let's take a moment to look at some of the variation in societies, and the first being the variation of unequal access of wealth, power, and prestige, as it refers to as age. In our society, when can we legally drink? When can we drive a car? When can we vote? There are some inequalities to the rights and privileges within our own society, and that's based sometimes on age. When is retirement? When in our society do we say, this is when you should stop working? All right. So we have underage and overage age requirements that limit some of our ability to engage in behavior, right? We call these age grades. Age grades is an organized category based on grade. And at certain times, people are lumped in at, in an age set. An age set is a group of persons initiated into an age grade simultaneously. Let me give you an example. The Tariki are a nomadic group in Kenya. And every 15 years, 
they move into a different category. Um, prior to their first 15th birthday, they're considered a child. When they turn 15, they move into the first phase, which is 15 years long, from 15 to 30, and they're considered a first warrior. From 30 to 45, they're considered elder warriors. 45 to 60, they move into judicial elders. And then anything over 65 is considered an elder. All right. So we see in this society men moving from one position to the other in a 15 year period, and this is called an age set. Our first form of inequality that we're going to focus on is egalitarian societies. An egalitarian society is a social system that has many valued positions as persons capable of filling them. This is completely opposite of a stratified society. There's no limit to the access of resources, to power, to prestige. Um, generally, egalitarian societies are food foraging people. Um, the only thing that separates uh, members of a society, whether they're a good hunter or a poor hunter, right? If you have bad hunting skills, you probably will be ostracized, right? Because you're not participating and sharing in the hunt, all right? Uh, in egalitarian societies, they have a tendency to share resources. So if you're a bad hunter and you don't contribute, you're more likely to be asked to leave, right? Let's take a moment to talk about rank societies. Your book defines rank societies, but I'll go into greater detail here. A rank society has unequal access to prestige or status, but not unequal access to wealth and power. Usually there's a number of uh, high status positions, and only certain individuals um, will be selected into these positions regardless of their personal skill, um, their wisdom, maybe they're industrious, or they have other personal traits that merit them being selected into these positions. If, for an example, we'll look at chiefdoms. Um, in a chiefdom, prestige and privilege um, are what differentiate a chief from its other members. Generally, a chief doesn't accumulate great wealth. Um, their standard of living generally is not different from the others. Um, however, uh, chiefs are, if you look at the economic system redistribution, are responsible for collecting and reallocating materials. Um, the, uh, the, the wealth or the surplus of food in a chiefdom usually gets dispersed um, amongst the chief. Uh, I'm going to have to cut some of this right here. One, ex in rank societies, we see a lot of um, relationships to kin. Uh, the terminology that we're going to introduce here is primogenitor, and primogenitor is the position, privileges, and titles passed from man to son. And in chiefdoms, we see primogenitor um, exists. Um, in Chiefdoms, we see that birth order is important. Usually the eldest uh, son uh, receives the title and the, the, the position after his father. There's little importance on uh, younger members uh, in the family. Uh, those who are um, chiefs usually wear more ornate dressings than other members. It's an important symbol. Usually individual status is linked to her hereditary titles. And usually the social position is expressed in economic terms such as tribute. We use the term tribute as uh, um, wealth is presented to chiefs. So in your book, it gives you a def uh, many different uh, examples of rank societies. Be familiar with those as we move on then into our definition of our third group of um, uh, f third form of inequality, which is a stratified societies. In stratified society, there's unequal forms of social rewards, and those are seen in wealth, power, and prestige. Um, we see that there are political, economic, and social inequality in stratified societies, and it's both permanent and is formally recognized by the members of society as be existing. Um, some in stratified societies, some people 
and entire groups of people have little to no access to the basic resources of a society. Um, there's noticeable dis differences in social uh, position, wealth, lifestyle, access to power, and differentiation in the standard of living. In a true stratified society, which uh, began about 5,500 years ago, there's a high degree of role specialization. As societies become more specialized, the system of social stratification becomes more and more complex. Take an example, uh, in our society, which is considered stratified, how many of you know how to build a computer from the ground up? Not too many, I imagine, right? Um, in our society, technology has become very complex, and the degree of role specialization in creating these computer systems have become very diverse. So this is a comparison of how more and more stratified, well, how stratified societies reflect more diversity in role specialization. In stratified societies, we start seeing new um, uh, anthropological terms being developed, such as social class. A social class is a category of individuals who enjoy equal or nearly equal privilege according to an evaluation system. Uh, I usually use the example of the Hindu caste system. A caste system is a special term of social class in which membership is determined by birth and remains fixed for life. Um, they're strictly uh, and, uh, and I have to redo that part. They're strictly, uh, they strictly practice uh, endogamy, which is marriage within uh, their own caste. There's no social mobility, and again, the definition of social mobility is the ability to change one's social position. So there's a lack of social mobility. Um, you will see a video on the Hindu caste system in this lecture. This is an ethnographic video that you'll be aware of. Uh, be aware that this is our example of, the, of a, a caste system and thus social, uh, our definition of social class. Uh, you're going to have to cut. That's oh, fine. <laughs> That's fine. No. Okay. Going here. There are some um, ways that we can determine social class in a society through two measures. One is symbolic indicators, and the other is through verbal evaluation. Symbolic indicators are activities or possessions that indicate a, form, a social group, a social class. If I were to say to you, what's the difference between white collar and blue collar, this is a symbolic indicator. Also, if I were to use the term slums and ghettos, this gives you an indication of a symbolic indicator. Then we have verbal evaluations, and these are terms and ways in which people speak and which evaluate society. And my example here again is if we were going to go out tonight and go shoot pool, it would be different for somebody else in a different social class if we were to go out and shoot billiards. Right? So same, same game, but it's the way in which that game is being described. It's a social evaluation cue, pool, billiards. One is indicative of a higher elite class, and the other is indicative of a lesser class. So these are indications of social class through symbolic indicators and verbal evaluation. Um, I'm going to give you some theories as to why stratification develops. The first theory is that stratification develops as productivity increases and a surplus is produced. This is one theoretical means as to how social stratification develops. If somebody has created a surplus, they have power and wealth over others, and thus leads to stratification. The second theory is that stratification develops when people have investments in land and technology, and therefore they can't move away from leaders they don't like. This leads to stratification. People are tied and invested, and they can't move away, and they're forced to stay in this system where one person has more power over another. The third theory, how stratification develops, is that it emerges only when there's a population pressure on a resource in a ranked society. For example, if we look back at our examples of ranked societies and we look at our chiefdom example, 
Um, if there's a small um, surplus of food and you're related by blood or marriage to the chief, you're likely going to get fed. If you aren't, chances are you probably won't enjoy some of the spoils of the surplus and thus you see uh, social stratification. In kinships, in chiefdoms, in rank societies, uh, the higher positions, which is limited probably to only one or a few, um, usually uh, kin um, are related. Oh, sorry, I'm about to go through all that again. Just cut all that. Um, again, in stratification and the development of stratification, if you're in a chiefdom, it's most likely those who are shared in the surplus and share in the privileges are those who are related to the chief. All right. So that'll end our discussion on social uh, stratification. Our next topic um, that you'll be aware of is something. I really don't know. We'll cut all that part out. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, but at the end of this lecture, there will be a video on the Hindu caste system. There will be some questions that you'll have to answer and submit afterwards. I look forward to your um, papers and make sure that you're keeping on track. All right. Again, have a nice day. It's a lousy, rainy day here in Nashville, New Hampshire. I'm hoping it's a better day where you are. All right. Have a good day. Or in the future. Or in the future. <laughs> oh, this, won't, this won't happen until May. <laughs>